Hello, everybody, and welcome to this live stream, my first live stream for my company, OSIN, ah, and Spotlight InfoSec. I'm thrilled to be here with you on YouTube, um, and I'm going to show you today something that many of you have been hitting me up with over the course of the last bunch of months. It's a tool called Obsidian, and many of you are already using it, is what I'm finding out, and I'm a little bit late to the party. But I know that many of you haven't learned it yet, haven't seen the power of this tool for OSINT investigations, so that's what I want to show you today. And before I go any further, you see my information here along the bottom of the screen. I own a company called Spotlight InfoSec, a training company for open source intelligence, my OSINT training, and I am a co-founder of the OSINT Games platform. But enough about the advertising and marketing. Let's get into this tool a little bit. Uh, the first thing I want to show you is three things that are already in the notes section of this live stream, or if you're watching this video after the fact, in the video on YouTube. In the notes section, you'll see, you'll see three URLs. One is for Obsidian, obsidian.md. That's the place where I'm going to go and download the actual application. And the second is for a GitHub repository of files that I've created with samples and examples in there so that you can get up and running as fast as you want. That's over on GitHub and that's also in the link. And then the third one is a link to a course that I've created on using Obsidian for OSINT. So if what I'm talking about here is going a little bit too fast for you or you just want to take your time with it, there's a course that can help you out with all of that. Of course, this is a live stream, so if you have questions, if you have comments, if you do things a little differently than I do and you've been using Obsidian, go ahead and toss those into the comments. I'm happy to address them as uh, as they go. Um, and in fact, if you are listening to me right now on the YouTube, uh, go ahead and say hi to me in the chat. Just let me know that there are people out there that I can interact with. So while I'm waiting for you to do that, what I'd like to do is just get into this demo, what it's going to be like. First off, I have a Windows 11 virtual machine that I downloaded from Microsoft. I am going to be using that, installing Markdown, downloading the example files that I told you about. And the best part about it is that all of this is free. Obsidian is free for personal use and educational use. And if you have a company of one person, if you have a company of two or more, then it does cost $50 per person per year. That's not a lot of money. I don't think it's a lot of money, especially if you're using this tool commercially. But let's get into it. Let's get into what we're going to be doing. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show my virtual machine. Hey, I, I see some people are saying hi to me. That's great. Cool. Welcome. Ah, Mo, hey from VA. Cool. Um, so if you have questions while we're going, uh, please go ahead and just toss them into the, uh, into the comments there. I'd love to interact with you. There's a little bit of a time delay here. I think about 30 seconds or so. So I might not get to your question right away. And please make the questions about Obsidian and using it for OSINT, not just random stuff. Justin, welcome, welcome. Elwin, welcome. All right, so let's get into the tool. Now I'm gonna start at the very beginning here. I'm gonna install the tool and download the files and really installing the tool is visiting obsidian.md. Again, it's in the notes section of this live stream. Click on this. Of course, if you have a Mac or a Linux system, it will show different information here. And then one of the things I wanted to point out is that pricing, again, please, uh, help the tool out. If you are using this for commercial purposes, go ahead and get a $50 yearly license per user. It'll really help them out. And it's the right thing to do. The next thing I'm going to show you are the Obsidian templates. Again, link to in the notes section of this, of this live stream. And what these are, it's just an example set of files to get you started. I've got some really interesting things in there to show you some of the features that might be interesting to you. So to get this, you have two ways of doing it. 
the easy way, which is just downloading them as a zip file, and then the hard way, or the not so hard way, but the different way using the git command line tool. For this example, I'm just going to keep it easy, going to keep it simple, and we're just going to go ahead and click on code and then download zip. Now you can probably see I've already got that down on my system, and that is very simple. All right, so let's take a look at this. I'm going to close this. We're going to look at those files real quick. I'm going to go to my downloads, and I have downloaded duplicates because I've already prepared for this demo. So first thing we're going to do is we are going to extract these Obsidian files, and I'm going to put them in my documents directory. You can put them wherever you want. I'm going to double click on this, and then that's going to show me the files, and I'm going to drag them out. And then my Windows system will uncompress them, decompress them. Next thing I'm doing, so over here in the documents directory are now the same files that I saw on GitHub, which is great. And this vault, what it's called is a vault, this has everything in it that you need to be successful in this, uh, in this, in this uh, live stream, or if you're watching this afterwards. Next, going to install Obsidian, and it really is quite a simple install click on that and it's installed now what it's going to do is it's going to open up and say well where are all your files do you want to make a new one you want to look at the help files that's these two right here or do you want to point it to a, a folder that already has files in it for me i'm going to go ahead and hit open and then i'm going to navigate to where i extracted those files from github which is right here in my documents folder double click there and select the folder now what it's going to do is it's going to look inside that folder, start indexing those files, and inside of that folder are some settings files to make sure that you have all the right plugins that I want you to have, to make sure that the, the, the actual vault is set up the way that I wanted it to be uh, set up. I've enabled certain plugins in Obsidian, and before we actually get into the tool and start using it, we have to talk about plugins. This is a little bit of the danger zone of Obsidian. Before I even get in any further, just uh, taking a step back, Obsidian is essentially a note-taking tool that allows you to connect notes to other notes and do a whole bunch of interesting things that are going to be very useful to you and I in the world of open source intelligence through these plugins. These plugins allow us to do some advanced tables in the note-taking tool, create mind maps, do other things with graphing information and plotting them on maps. And so these plugins, many of which the community of and surrounding Obsidian has created, those plugins are going to be essential to what we need to do. The problem becomes that where those plugins are not actually included with the core installation of Obsidian. Obsidian, the application says, listen, if you're going to enable some of these community plugins, just know that we haven't reviewed them. There might be other people in the community that have reviewed them. Uh, the developers might be very trustworthy, but there is risk here because Obsidian allows through these plugins, the manipulation of files on your computer. So I'm doing this in a virtual machine. I'm not doing this on my host system. So I've kind of contained any problem if there was a malicious plugin that I enabled. In this case though, uh, I think the, the value outweighs the risk with these plugins. But these plugins are open to you and my and me to review. So you don't have to use these plugins. And if you want to, you can code review the plugins as well. Um, so the way that Obsidian works is on your system, there are files. Those files are written in, in a language called Markdown. And Markdown is very simple and text-based. All of these files are on your system, though, which is so cool because you're not sending stuff back to some third-party website that you don't know who owns it. The files are literally on your system, which increases our privacy and operational security. So 
what I'm going to do is head back over to my virtual machine where it's asking me this very important pin question. Do you want to turn off safe mode? For this demo and for what I'm suggesting you do, I would say, yeah, turn off safe mode. If you don't, then what happens is you can't use these cool plugins that I'm going to be showing you how to use. So we'll choose the red button. Notice the red button and the blue button. Yeah. All right. Next thing it does is it throws us into the settings. I'm not going through all of these settings, but the settings are the core place where you can configure Obsidian. You can turn things on and off. You can change it from dark mode to light mode. You can do a whole bunch of things. And in the training class that I mentioned in the beginning, um, I show you how to go through all of these different settings. I'm just going to close that. Now, I know that I have a small screen here. I, I have actually a big monitor that I use or several monitors sometimes when I'm doing my work. But for the point of this live stream, I'm just using a small monitor or a small window. So I'm going to maximize the Obsidian window here. I'm going to click the Start Here button, and there's our beginning. So this is Obsidian. And quite simply, there's, there's several different uh, areas or panes. Here we have, this is the File Explorer area where we can look inside these folders. These folders like Example Case have notes in them. There's also a JPEG image in it. So this is very much like the File Explorer on your Windows or Mac or Linux system where you have folders or directories and files. And then we have these files that we can click on and see different things that are written in there. Um, the next pane over here, this is where we do our work. This is where we edit things or where we view things. You can see I've got these little numbers here, these line numbers enabled. And if I wanted to, I could type things and it appears on the screen. This is in the edit mode. If we want to go to the read mode, we can just click on this little pencil. And now it looks a little bit nicer in here, like what you might see in a polished document. So we don't have the line numbers. We can't edit things unless we click back over here and switch to edit. So you have multiple views of the content. Here you can see I've got a bulleted list. The use templates is heading th level three, just like you'd use in Word or some other tool to make documents. This is heading level two, and we've got the bullets. If I click over here, you can see that when I click on these headings, we have these number signs, these pound signs. Here we have three of them because this is heading level three. These bullets, um, these bullets are not actually bullets. They're just dashes. And all of this is just markdown. So if you're interested in using Obsidian, it takes just a little bit of effort to learn, oh, if I want to add a heading, I can do a, a pound sign, pound sign, pound sign. That's three levels deep. That's heading three. And it, I can make that content. Or if I want to make something fixed width um, and uh, code like, I can use these back ticks around it and it sets it off. So it's really not that hard. And one of the plugins that you might want to choose to use is the WYSIWYG plugin um, that you can download through the Obsidian application. And that puts up a menu on the right hand side. Uh, what you see is what you get menu. And you can click on the B for bold, the I for italics, and you can do all of those things. All right, so we've covered this main area here. There's a ton more that I want to show you, uh, but I need to get you just the basics so that we can get into this demo. Over here, we have several other features that we can use. Uh, you can see they're in tab format. We have backlinks, uh, other documents that are linking to this. We have uh, outgoing links, links that this document send, uh, sends people to. We've got tags. Just like you've got hashtags in social media, you can use tags in Obsidian. And then an outline view here, which looks just like a, a normal outline. All right, so that was a very quick overview of this. Why do we actually need this? Well, what I've got in this file is a whole bunch of sample content for you. It's not meant to uh, be your end-all, be-all type of of tool to to do everything that you need to what it's meant to do is show you some of the cool capabilities 
and then have you go ahead and make your own standard operating procedures, make your own templates, make your own whatever, and use the tool for your OSINT. All right, so let's take a look at some of these files that we have over here. Um, I have the start here page, which is where we are. This has a bunch of information on that you might want to look at. We have this introduction presentation, which we can skip in the readme we can skip to. Up here, we have a template directory, which I'll get to. Example case folder has a whole bunch of example files that I just made up data and put in here. And then we've got the standard operating procedures. Now, that brings up a really interesting point. Why use Obsidian? And for me, Obsidian not only has some of these really cool plugins that allow me to do some things that I might need other tools for, but it also allows me to link different notes, which if you're doing open source intelligence, you know that everything is interconnected, right? You have a person, that person has a spouse or a partner, which is a connection to another person. So in Obsidian, we can have one note for person number one. And then we can say this person is connected to that person over there and we put a link to that other person's note. Once we do that, those records are connected. And it's very simple to do this, as I'll show you over here. We also can do things with, with domains, with IP addresses, with locations. We can make mind maps in here. It is so cool. And we have a whole bunch of those different things right here. Now, there's another folder here called Standard Operating Procedures, and I want to point out that before we go any further. Standard Operating Procedures many times live in a static document on some, in some Word document on your drive at work. And every now and then you'll open it up and you'll look at it, or maybe you have a wiki that you use or something like that, or there's a OneNote directory that has all of the techniques. And, and if you have this type of data, this is where you're going to go. These are the sites you're going to visit. But what if that was inside of your note-taking vault? What if you had one directory for standard operating procedures, how you do your work, and then you had another directory that had all of your notes in it. You can do that here. And not only can you do that, but in your standard operating procedures, you can show the connections between the data. Let me show you. Over here, I have standard operating procedures. I've made it simple into data types and actions. So here we have a bunch of notes like email address. When I click on it, uh, it says if you have an email address, go and do breach site and breach site searching, email verification, HTTPS certificates. So if I have an email address, I can come over here and look at the things that I might want to or need to do. This is really helpful to me because sometimes I get stuck. I'm like, oh, I know I need to do this and this, but what else do I need to do? Well, you come to your standard operating procedures and you notice that these sites here, or these, these, this text has these double square brackets on either side. That's how we link to other pages in Obsidian. And in fact, this breach site search, if I hold down the control key and click on and just hover over it, you can see a preview of what's there. If I go to email verification, I'll go to Hunter. No, I know. Ooh, HTTPS certificates. Maybe I want to go there. I can just hold down that control or that command key, click once with my left button, and it takes me there. So these pages are connected and they're living documents. So now I know, oh, if I want to do HTTPS certificate transparency report queries, I go to CRT.sh. It's built in here. You've probably been noticing while I've been going through this, there's a couple of other things here like this, this uh, content up here at the top. This is called front matter. And the front matter has data in it that tells Obsidian how to treat the data on that slot, on that note. So here we have tags action. This is the same thing if, as if I typed in a hashtag action. All it does is it tags this note with action with that word action and for me that is an action that i would do in my standard operating procedures 
Now, some of these notes might have other things, like when we came over here to email address, we have email, email address, we can put multiple tags up here. Why does all this matter? Well, some of you might be familiar with the tool Multigo or OSINT Combine's data visualization tool that allow you to show connections between data. In OSINT, I mean, in, in Obsidian, that's built in, and that's over here with the open graph view. If I click this, check it out. It opens up a graph. Now I have this graph looking at the example case data. I've said, look at that folder only. Only. I'm gonna, instead of doing that, I'm going to type in a path, path colon, and then I'm gonna say, look at the stuff in my standard operating procedures. Look at how I've connected all of these standard operating procedures. I'm gonna filter out and remove all these tags here. Look, if I have a business name, oh, <laughs> click there a little bit too soon. Let's say that I have a business name, or let's see, image analysis. I'm going to zoom in here, image analysis. Look, image analysis is tied to examine for metadata, reverse image search, and this file. This file is connected to these other things. This is all dynamically mapped with those tags and with links to other documents. So as you're writing things up in your, in your OSINT work, you're like, oh, this person is connected to that person. When you do that, Obsidian will make this map for you. And if you are using those tags, we can specify to turn those on. And look, here's that tag for action. So when I click on this, all of these things that it's connected to are actions. This is all focused on that standard operating procedures part. So this is just my SOP. It has nothing to do with my actual case, but you can see right now the power of this as we start adding notes for people, for companies, for domains, and start linking them up. We can use this built-in uh, graph viewer to see those connections that may or may not be there. It's really, really powerful, and it's built in. Yeah, cool. All right, so let's take a look at some of this other stuff. So I covered the standard operating procedures. I've covered the start me. Um, there's a couple of other things I need to show you before we get into like actually working a case and, and an example case, and that is the command palette. See, I think one of the biggest barriers of using command line tools for open source intelligence or people that haven't grown up around command line tools in Linux is you have to know all of the commands. Because if you want to use like the wget tool or you want to use some other command line tool, you have to figure out what do I need to install? How does it run? What things do I need to provide it? In Obsidian, very, very simple. We can use the command palette here and then type in whatever we want. So I'm going to click that, and let's say that I want to sort some things. Maybe I've got a whole list of data, and I want to sort it. I can just type in sort. Look, here's all the different things I can do to sort something. Or maybe I want to make a list of uh, data bulleted. A bulleted list, I can type in bullet. Toggle bulleted list. And you can see that working Right here, I'll just select these things right here, These this bulleted list. I will hit the command palette, type in bullet, and then hit this, and that bulleted list now doesn't have those bullets. Of course, I can hit control Z to undo it, uh, which is really nice too. So a lot of the things that we do by default are just built in here, and you can use that command palette to do everything. Um, one of the things I loved doing before I met Obsidian and fell in love with it was making mind maps. Yeah, you know mind maps. They're visual note-taking. Well, what if you could make a mind map of your notes? You can do that. Let me just click over here. Open command palette. Mind map. It says preview the current note as a mind map. And it will dynamically make... Let's see, hang on, oh, let me close this. And that did not work, but let me show you that on another slide. Let's go into here. Oh. Let's, da -da. mind map. 
preview the current note as a mind map, and there we go. So it dynamically created this mind map based upon the indentations, the bullets, the headers that I have here. And it's very simple here to, to see how the data relates to each other. We can collapse different uh, pieces to highlight what we want, take pictures and put it in our reports. And it's built into the tool with a plugin that I've installed. All right, let's see. Um, what are some essential commands? Geo, you know, that's a really interesting question. Some essential commands, it really depends on what you're going to do. And I'm going to show you while I work through this case, I'm going to show you how to do some of these commands. But if you ever have a question like, hey, I want to take this word. And let's go over here. I'll type in a middle name of David. Oh, no, David is not bold. I want to bold that. Well, I can just double click on that. Hit the command palette and type in bold. It says toggle bold. And if you notice over here, it shows you the hotkey. Control B. So I could either hit Control B or click that, and now it's bolded. So if you if you don't know what to do in Obsidian, like to italicize things, make a link, do a mind map, connect something, just hit Control P to bring up that palette, or Command P to bring up that palette, or hit the open command palette and just type in keywords, and it'll show you. So you also see over here we have asterisks, asterisks. <laughs> you see these two stars before and after the word David. That's how you tell it to bold some word. So if I wanted to just instead of hitting control B for a word, I can just type in star star um, Michael. Uh, I always type in Micah instead of Michael. Star star. And there I've bolded it. It's really simple to use markdown. All right. Does it work with, oh, does it work with other uh, languages? Yeah, absolutely. Um, whatever language you're you're using on your system, absolutely. For me, though, I only use English because that's all I can, uh, all I really know. All right, so let's get into some of this data. Now, I've made up a lot of this content in here and just to show you some of the connections and I just want to like work a case with you. I've got this example stuff here, but instead of going through it right now, I'm going to create a new folder. So I'm going to, let's see, create a new folder. I'm going to call that case and then whatever. I'm going to give it a case number. And in here, I'm going to create a new note. Oh, I don't know where that note went. Uh-oh. So in Obsidian, it will create a note back where you were, where wherever you're, you, you currently are, but sometimes you can't find out where that is. Here we have an untitled note, and I don't see untitled note over here. Well, it's actually not that hard to do. We're going to name this note. I'm going to name it uh, domain example. You know what? Let's just call it example.com. Example.com, hit enter, and now we have a record. Now, I don't see example.com over here, and there's a special cool place right down here where it says more options. I can click that, and here's additional things that you can do, including reveal file in navigation. Where is this example.com file? Oh, it's inside the example case. Well, I don't want that. So I can just click it and drag it up there, and now it's in my case. So... We can click and drag. We can use that reveal file and do those things. Let's see. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Cool. All right. So let's just take an example case. Let's do uh, example.com. Now, the thing I like to do, doing here is adding that front matter. So dash, 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 three dashes. And then you can put whatever you want here. If you're using a specific plugin like i'll show you in a little bit then we might need to add certain front matter here um if you're just going to maybe create tags i like creating tags for my data because tags are another way of connecting things think of these as like hashtags so i'm going to create a tag of domain well domain because that's what this example.com is all right so now i've got this tagged as domain and now I can do my work. I can do, let's see, make a heading with two pound signs. 
and say um, purpose. Let's just see purpose. Uh, investigate the example.com domain for uh, possible ownership. And you can see I'm not doing anything specific. I'm just typing in here, just like you would in any note taking application. The cool thing is, is if you want to do markdown stuff, you can do that as well. Like if I hit the home key and I do a dash and space, it makes a bullet. So I've just made a bulleted list there. You see the little bullet on the beginning here? I'll make this a little bit bigger. And if I hit enter now, it creates another bullet. It just does things easy. Um, we might also want to pivot to um, a pivot on any good data. There we go. All right, so let's start our investigation into example.com. Um, yeah, Luis uh, mentions the Discord server. Absolutely, uh, there is a Discord server. Let me just create a new workspace over here. I'm going to create a new desktop. Ooh, I'm going to create a new desktop. So this is working, and this is noting. There we go. So our notes are in one desktop, and then if I do work, I can switch over, uh, switch over to this desktop and come over here. So what Luis mentions is over here, this community. There, there's an amazing community. Now, I will tell you that this community is really supportive, has a great Discord server, very active. And a lot of it is about note taking and knowledge management or personal knowledge management, PKM. So the application to OSINT is something that I'm starting to do and people like Luis and other people have mentioned. Um, they, we're doing that kind of out, outside of the knowledge management that they're doing in the community, but really great forum and Discord here. So let's start doing our, our OSINT investigation. Let's We have a domain. Let's run that domain through a DNS tool, right? Maybe we go to DNS dumpster, dumpster.com, and we're going to type in example.com. Oh. All right, so this tool is for your notes. So it's not going to do stuff like Hunchly and some of the other tools where it automatically collects everything that I'm doing in the browser. Although you could run this tool alongside that. So you have Hunchly or another tool collecting what your browser sees and then you have your notes, which is what you're writing. So let's go ahead and take a look at what I found for example.com. We've got some DNS servers. We've got some IP addresses. Let's go ahead and just copy this stuff and see what happens. I'm going to copy that, switch back over to my notes, and we're going to do something, say, uh, run domain, uh, let's do run DNS tool. I'm going to input the current date by hitting the at key, yeah. So I can say, hey, today, and it puts in the date, uh, ran DNS dumpster, and output is here. Now, if I want, I can go ahead and make this my own note. DNS dumpster, output is here. I can link this to another page, or I can just paste in what I got from the DNS dumpster application. Now we've got a server, we've got a domain name there, we've got an IP address. So I'm just fixing up this content right now. We have another one, let's see, these are servers. I can any cast, all right, we've got this, let's just, we've got B and then another IP address. All right, so it looks like we have this uh, two different IP addresses, we've got some server names. Nice. All right. So these are the DNS servers. Well, the DNS servers, let's go ahead and add a heading for them. DNS servers or also called NS records. Now, each one of these are their own system, right? So we have example.com up here. Why wouldn't we make square bracket, square bracket, square bracket, square bracket. And let's go ahead and make notes for these 
hosts and for these IP addresses. Ooh. Now you can see that these are actually in red, right? The previous ones we've seen uh, links have been in blue, but these are in red. That means that these have not yet been created. I've created links, but I don't have anything associated with those links right now. If I wanted to create a new note, I can hold down control and click on it. And look, there's a new note for the server, the server page. And up here I can say tags domain. And then I can say, oh, wait, look, it already shows me that this is connected to example.com. See, since we linked one note to another, we now have a connection there and we can go back and look at this in this work. So you can kind of see how this is fitting together. Let's go back to example.com. I'm going to go ahead and do this other one and I'm going to do some front matter tags. IP address front matter like this is totally optional I could if I wanted to just do hashtag IP address and that would be fine as well all right so we've got that we also might want to link this to this page over here right because this server the a dot iana dot dash servers dot net resolved to that IP address so let's go ahead and link that and maybe say at today, um, this IP resolved to, now to link to another document, square bracket, square bracket, and then it pulls up the documents that I can link. And I can just type a name or this is the one right here inside of the case folder, link to there and oh, misspelling. And you can see that it, it highlighted that as a misspelled word. Now this is connected. So if I come back over here, we now have a link from the IP address page and that example.com page. As we build out our notes and we create notes for individual resources like people, IPs, domains, businesses, websites, each of those notes we connect and the more connected it is, the more we can see those relationships over here in graph view. I'm going to go ahead and take that off search for path which is the folder and let's go to our case 86876 whatever and look as we're writing and as we're connecting things here's example.com connected to all of those different notes and there's the hashtag here's a hashtag over here or here's the tag you can tell over here which notes have been created and which ones haven't because this one's red has not been created yet but this one over here is blue it has been created kind of neat right it all it, it works the way that our OSINT minds work during our investigations um do they look the same as outbound links so there the, let's check this out so we're going to come over here to example.com now there's a couple of other links over here we've got backlinks links to this page and we can see that there's some unlinked mentions here which i'll get to in a little bit and then we've got outgoing links so this is pages that are linked here from this one. And you can see the I, the a.iana, the 199. And then these two have not yet been created. And it tells you not yet created. So these are outgoing links. Now, the coolest thing about this is these unlinked mentions. Let's say that you get, you're going on your case and you're finding things and you're copying and pasting in, and maybe you've created the domain example.com, but that was two days ago and, and you've, you're kind of done working on that. But let's say that you find a person. So I'm going to go ahead and create a person. Um, let's see, this person's name will be, uh, well, Micah Hoffman. What the heck? Oh, hang on. Let me click over here. Micah, let's make it. Micah Hoffman. All right, so I have a person named Micah Hoffman. Now, another thing that you can do is template things. If you, when you are looking at people or IP addresses or domains or businesses, are always doing the same thing, you're always looking for the same types of information, you can make a template and then use that. I probably shouldn't have used Micah Hoffman. Let's just use a different thing, 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. That's the IP address for Google's DNS, but it's an IP address. 
Because of that, I can come over here to Insert Template. Now I've made two sample templates, one for domains or IPs and one for person. Oh, let's use the person one. I'm sorry. Let's go back. Micah Hoffman. There we go. All right. So let's come over here to Template. And all this is going to do is paste in content that I've already created. So picture this, your team or you have the things that you want to collect about a person when you are investigating them. You put that in a template. And then when you make a new person record, you just say, use that person template. And there you go. You have that content. It's really, really simple to do. Now, Getting back to Geo's question about the outbound links and stuff, you can see that I've got a whole bunch of unlinked mentions here. Let me go ahead and simplify this. I'm going to take, oh, well, let's just say education, yeah, area of study, website management for the example.com domain. And now, or website. Now, I haven't actually um, taken that example.com and, and linked it to anything. Normally, since I know that domains are things that I would link, I would put the double square brackets around it and link it to the other example.com. But let's say that you forgot, or let's say that you copied data from some site and you just paste it in here. In this unlinked mentions section over here, what you will find is the tool itself has looked through this text and said, hey, you have the word example.com here. Did you know that there's actually an example.com note? So it's finding those links for us. And no, it's not using artificial intelligence. No, it's not sending stuff off to Apple or Google or any other site. It's doing it all on your computer. So that right there tells me, hey, I have a possible relationship. All right, so let's go ahead and link to that file. And now this changes to a link. And if I control click or control mouse over it, you can see the preview and I can go to it. Cool, right? Yeah, now you can see this is all kind of coming together. But wait, there's more. I want to show you some of the more advanced things. Now, I told you that I have this course that I've made that shows you how to do a lot of these things. I've got a lot of the basic stuff already uh, sh shown in that course. I want to show you some of the other cool things that you can do. Like sometimes you have latitudes and longitudes. And like one of the techniques I used to teach students was you go to Weigel.net to look for wireless data. And then you have all of the, the, when you search for an SSID, a network name, and you get all these latitudes and longitudes. Well, you use a tool to ex extract those. Then you have latitudes and longitudes in a CSV file. Then you take that upload it to Google Earth, and then that will plot where those latitudes and longitudes are. You don't have to do that with, with Obsidian. There's a, there's a plugin. Let me go over to the example case and show you this list of possible locations. Picture this. When you're writing, when you're writing your, your document, Hey, we have a possible anti-aircraft site right here. Hey, we have a, a tank was sighted over here. You can have those geolocation, uh, those latitudes and longitudes there, and you just enter it in like this. Or if you don't know how to enter it in, we can do 0.6. Um, let's control P or bring up that command palette. Type in geo and says, hey, do you want to enter a new geolocation note? Add geolocation front matter, that's up at the top, or add an inline geolocation link. Let's do that last one. There we go. Now, when I type stuff like 1600 pen, look at that. It's actually looking things up. Now, this is looking up stuff on the internet, but um, we're using that. So if I type Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Avenue, let's see. Hey, we've got that. Let's type in Washington, D.C. and Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C. There we go. We can click on that and it will get the, the latitude and longitude of that. You're like, OK, that's just geolocation, Micah. That's that's not that hard. Right. But the power comes when you view these on the map using the globe icon over here. 
open map view. And if you look, we now have a map with all of these points in it. Here, we have point number five. It shows you, it shows you point number five right there. Here we have point four. And if we zoom in here, I'm guessing not only do we have point one and point two, but we also have 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And if I click on that, it brings me to that exact location here. So for latitudes and longitudes, we can use mapping filters in here, which is really, really interesting for us. Yeah. So again, this might not be exactly where you wanted. This is Pennsylvania Avenue, but maybe you wanted that Pennsylvania Avenue over here where the White House is. You can add that. Or maybe you want to add like a map in your note. Well, we can do that too. Over here, I have a location. I'm going to just switch over there, close this extra pane. And you see up here, I have tags, property, residential. Maybe this is somebody's house. And here's a location. With this, it will actually create a map inside of the page for us. You can click over here to edit the block and here's see how it's configured, whether it's in dark mode or what zoom level it's at and you can embed this in your notes. So picture this, you have somebody that has a property at a certain place, like over here in uh, Columbia. You can just put a map inside of your note. So you don't have to go to Google Maps or in this case, OpenStreetMap. And you can zoom in. We have different layers and stuff. We can even draw on the map. Let's draw, oh, sorry, there we go. We're gonna draw on the map, take screenshots, it's all there, right? And we have markers and other things as well. We can make it full screen. And of course, we could send this off to OpenStreetMaps or Google Maps or whatever, because we have the latitude and longitude here. But that's because of these plugins that I've enabled. Now, I'm a big fan of mind maps. You already saw me do a mind map. There's another thing that we can do, and that's creating an actual mind map. And in the example case, I have example of standalone mind map. And here you can see Alistair Kemp. This is more like the functions that you would have in FreeMind, XMind, MindMup, but again, it's all on your computer. So here we have Alistair Kemp. I can double click, I can change that person's name, hit the tab key, and I'm creating something else. Uh, works at, oh, and then tab key again, um, example do domains. And if I wanted to then create a peer, I'm just using the keyboard for this, but you can click on these and add things and remove things. You can even move some of these around if you wanted to just by clicking on them and doing that. It's a mind map app inside of here, saving you time. All right. Um, so let's see. Uh, the tags, are those two tags or separated by space? So going back, let's see, Luis says on the tags, let's go back to doo -doo -doo -doo, list of possible look, it, I think it's here. These are two different tags. When you have tags in the met, in the front matter, they actually tags cannot have spaces. Tags can have dashes or underscores, but you can't have spaces. And in fact, if I, I'll show you that using like the hashtag. So hashtag location and if i put a space in there and type in something else you can see the tag has ended if i wanted to make a tag with both of these values i can put them together i can use camel case use uppercase and lowercase use a dash something like that so property is one tag residential is another if i wanted to put them together into one tag i need to connect them uh, how would you extract this for court prosecution? Ooh, that's a good question. The answer is, I don't know. I'm one of those people that if I don't know the answer, I'll just tell you I don't know it. Um, I don't do work that, that heads to court, um, but I'm pretty sure that there are people that can show you that. You can ex save all of these pages or each of these pages as a PDF. So if you come over here, you see export to PDF. You can choose the size percentage we're going to export let's just export to our desktop there we go yeah let's open it in edge sure give some microsoft love here and here we have the hashtag location there's the map and there's that so you can export these notes to pdfs 
and then hash them if you need to and present them. That might be a way. Um, if other people have ways that they've maybe used uh, the tool to do that, I'm open to that. Like I said, I don't know everything and I'm okay with not knowing everything. Now, one of the other really, really neat things that I love is another plugin. Picture this. Um, let's go back to our the case that we created, this case 867 whatever. Let's say that we are working on this and we've just pulled up these DNS servers. Or let's see. Oh, here's some A records. Let's see these A records. Ah, example.com resolves to this IP address. All right. I'm going to copy this, go back over here, three, um, three number signs, and we've got uh, DNS A record, and I'm going to paste that in. Now, I'm going to go ahead and link it because I know it's an IP address, and I'm going to want to do something with that. But you know what? In OSINT, don't you usually find like all these other interesting things that you then need to investigate. But how do you keep track of all of the things you need to do, all of those tasks you need to complete? You have another document, you have a to-do list. What if you could embed to-do list items inside your notes? Like here, I can do a dash, space, square bracket, space, square bracket, and look at that, it turns into a checkbox. Remember to reverse IP lookup this address. And I can even link to my standard operating procedure. So uh, square bracket, square bracket, I can type in the IP, ooh, IP address. Oh, there we go. See IP address for standard operating procedures. I'm linking this task to another page. Now you're probably wondering, so what? You have this embedded in a page. You're going to open up multiple pages and do a whole bunch of things. How are you going to remember to come back to this page, Micah? And I am thrilled that you asked me that question. Let's take a look over here at our examples. All right. Here I have Isaiah Kemp and Gabriella Parkington. And you can see, let's see, as I went through this, it says find current residence. This is her prior address, again, just fictitiously. Here's her prior address, but I didn't find her current residence. And maybe my investigation is taking me away from doing this work, but I wanna remember to do this. Well, because I've entered this task and I've created a page, called tasks, for example, files. Look at this. See all these? These are all of the things that I have put into my example cases for things I need to do. I'm going to zoom out a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. And if we look here, we see look up the email in breach data for Isaiah Kemp email address. And you know what? If I click this and say, oh, I did that, or, or my buddy uh, Luis did that, yeah, I can just click here. And it's gone. And if I go to Isaiah Kemp's page, here we go. You can see, look up the email and breach data is checked off. Wow, right? Isn't that cool? So think about this. You don't have to stop your investigative process when you find these pivot points. You can set a reminder, set a task while you're working through it. And then you just need to make sure to check this open tasks and make sure everything is checked off before you end your assessment. Oh, and for the tasks, you can have high, medium, low priority tasks. You can only look at tasks in certain directories. It's very flexible. Now, you probably notice over here when I clicked on that link, it highlighted this username section in pink. And it did that because that's where this perform username, a uh, perform search of the username was that I clicked on this perform search of username. Oh, and you probably have noticed that I've now got two notes open at the same time. Well, holding holding the shift key, I can move this one, slide this one in and out. So I, I can move back to this one. Yeah. And you probably have noticed that I can embed images inside of the pages. Now, this is some native stuff to uh, Obsidian. 
You can just drag and drop images, videos, uh, other documents in these notes, and it makes a link to those documents. So here we have Pexels, Pixabay, whatever, JPEG, and you can see over here we've got that image right here. So it'll save it in that, that group of files for your case, but um, it, it will also link in the document. And have you ever gotten like a picture and it's like super huge and you need to keep it at that resolution, but you don't want to put it in your notes at that resolution? I see this pipe 200. Hang on, let's close that. Zoom in here. See this pipe 200? That says take that picture and automatically scale it down to 200 pixels. If I remove it, look how big it is. That is huge. That That is a big, big face. I can undo that and I can change this to whatever I want. So you have the picture, it's just scaled to whatever size you want. If I want it 400, there you go. Built in, right? Yeah, shiny, nice, new stuff. Um, let me just see here, I have a bunch of other things. Oh, gosh, the, the other thing I wanna show you is, is um, tables. Uh, remember, I'm doing all of this work in the editing view, if you will or in the, the work view. Here, if I click on this, now you see this in the preview view. And for those of you that are looking at this and going, oh, I would never submit this to a customer or use this in court. The colors are wrong, whatever. That's cool. I've selected a certain theme for this example vault, and you can change that just by going into the settings and choosing one of many themes, or you can create your own theme that's more professional and and uh, works for you so all of these wonderful things the other thing i wanted to show you is something extremely neat uh, and it, when i started doing this i was like this is incredible wait i've got a, do you have uh do you have to have the image video downloaded to drag and drop um i don't know that let let's give it a try let's give it a try so the question is um let's go over to gabriella I'm just going to go over here and let's go to um, just a free image site. I don't want to violate anybody's copyrights or anything like that. So I'm just going to type in woman image over here. These are Pexels is a site that allows you to have free images. So let's say that this woman right here is the one that I'm interested in, um, in using for Gabriella Pinkington slide. Let's say open image in new tab. And now... If I right click and copy this image, come over here about the person, uh, image, paste. There we go, pasted image. Now it's called pasted image. And over here, I now should have pasted image in my example case. I'm not sure if that, ex if that helps you out or not, but you can also link to documents and web pages on the internet too. So if I wanted to um, come back over here and instead of linking and copying this and, and pasting, I can link to this page as well. And I can insert an image and instead of pointing it at pasted image, I can point it to that. And yeah, hang on, hang on. I always forget how to do this. You know what? Let's do this. Control P, image. No. Nope. Uh, insert image. No. Nope. Insert picture. Up. Oh, maybe. Yep. It's failing me in that point. We can actually do that. So I frequently. Oh, you know what? I think it is here. Let me see if I got this. Hang on. Hang on. I think I can do this. I'm going it's square brackets then um then the other brackets so this is uh avatar image and then if we put a parenthesis paste parentheses yes <laughs> yeah so again markdown which is what i'm working in here can be a little tricky and what i remembered was that the first part here is the name so this is i've named this avatar and then here we've got the parentheses which 
has the link to the image. Now in this case, I'm pulling, when I open this note, it's pulling that image directly from the website, which is not something you normally do in OSINT because if that website changes, you're looking at a different picture here. But you know, maybe that is something that you want to do. Um, yeah, cool. All right. Hope that answers your question. Now, here is something amazing that I want to show you. And uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, like these people here, Alistair, Gabriella, Isaiah. Hang on, let's change this. Let's just take this out. I don't like that in there. Um, let's say that these people are connected, and maybe we'll call them a family. We're going to do a new note. Uh, family, family, Parkington. All right. So one of the things that we commonly do is we make these network diagrams, right? Person one is connected to person two. Person two knows person three. That means that person three may know person one by association. We infer that. Or maybe we have a domain, an IP address, and website, and we make these network diagrams. In Obsidian, you can do that. And it's actually really easy. Now, I'm going to try to do this just by hand, and we'll see what happens. And I'll show you a quick and easy way to do this afterwards. So the first thing we're going to do is do a mermaid. Mermaid is essentially telling, uh, by putting this in, the three backslashes and then mermaid, I'm telling the application, I'm entering in some code here that you're going to need to execute. Now I need to tell it I'm entering in a graph, and that graph is top down. And now let's make some points. My first point is person A, and I'm going to call that person um, doo -doo -doo -doo, Alistair. Alistair. And I'm going to say Alistair is connected to, just making two dashes and an arrow, to Gabriella. So person B, or object B, is Gabriella. All right. Now, I've just connected those two things. Let's see what happens if I click off here. Look at that. Alistair to Gabriello. Nice, right? It does it in the tool. Now, let's say we want to make it more complicated, right? Now, since I've already defined A for Alistair, B for Gabriella, I can just reference B is connected to... Let's get a little complicated here. Let's, let's insert a relationship. Um, uh, is mother of so all i've done is made two dashes is mother of that comment saying put this inside of this link and then double dash angle bracket or angle bracket there is mother of c and for this one i'm going to use a different shape isaiah and let's see how this looks Look at that. Alistair's related to Gabriella. Gabriella is mother of Isaiah. And it makes this dynamically as I type. And it just gets easier and easier as we start, as we keep making this. So now, of course, Alistair is probably might be related since Alistair's related to Gabriella. Gabriella is related to Isaiah. Maybe Alistair is related to Isaiah too. Could be the father, but we don't know. So let's go ahead and do uh, A. And we're going to do dot. Uh, we're going to do a couple of dashes here, and then I believe that's the way to see. And let's see what happens. Look at that! It inserted a dash, a dotted line, saying we're inferring a connection between Alistair and Isaiah. And if I wanted to put in here something like possible father, there you go. And it makes this in the tool. I think when I saw this, I was like, wait a second. So I don't need to go to draw IO for flow charts and diagrams. I don't need to uh, use some other to-do list to track what I need to do. I don't need to um, go and have a separate mind map application. I might not even need to use Google Earth or Google Maps if I'm plotting points. This tool does it all for free or $50 if you're a business uh, person. That's pretty darn powerful. Now, if you're wondering, how do I do these network diagrams? It's actually quite simple. And you can do some really powerful diagrams using this mermaid flowchart. 
This tells you exactly what to type in and what you get. Here you go, flowchart, top down. I typed graph instead of flowchart, top down, start to stop. Here's left to right instead of top to down. Um, and you know what? There's even other things that you can do. Let's see. If we wanted to, we could even go to a really cool, let's see, if we go to, no, hang on. There is a online flowchart and editor that has examples. And look at this. This is similar to what I just made. Here we have a graph, top down. A is square bracket Christmas, and that connects to uh, get money. B, go shopping. So here you can see the connections there, and you can see we can make conditionals, multiple branches. This can get pretty complicated, and it's all built in. You just take this code right here, whatever it is that you make here, and then you copy it and you paste it into a mermaid block inside of the app. It's really, really easy to do. And if that's confusing to you, you know, um, all it takes is a little bit of, of um, a little bit of work, a little bit of of getting in there and actually trying it out. Now, the next thing I want to show you, I know we're over an hour, but with my live streams, I just go until I'm done. So if you need to leave, cool, that's all right. Let me just show you how to do example case. I think in Alistair, we have a table. Yeah, let me make this a little bit smaller. There we go. So this is what a table looks like. And you can kind of see the columns and the rows. Yeah. Now, since we have a table here, um, I've installed an advanced table tool. And you can see it right over here. It looks like a spreadsheet table. And you see there's a toolbar right over here. And this toolbar allows you to move rows, insert rows, insert columns, sort. Yeah, let's say I wanted to sort this column. I just click in it and say, sort this column. And it's sorted it. And if I go to the reading mode, it looks like a nice table. Really simple to do, right? And you can see how easy it is to make these things. You just type stuff out. If I wanted to hit enter and type in, of uh, fuzzy bunny one two three hit tab i'm in the next cell just like it would be in excel or LibreOffice or another another thing all right and you can do all of these things very very simply um let me see if there's something else i wanted to show you are do you have any questions i know i've kind of been introducing you to a lot of different techniques and maybe moving a little bit fast and energetically but the reality is is that at a certain point, this gets to be fun because the tool doesn't get in the way of your documentation. Many of you, I'm sure, have, have had the same experience that I have. When you're documenting in, I'm not going to name tools, but whether it's a note-taking tool or whatever, you, you have to come out of the data. You have to, you're, you're working in one or more tools to to you know, capture what your next steps are, uh, look up your standard operating procedures, make those diagrams, export them, put them in your notes. And all of it takes time and other applications. I'm not saying that Obsidian is everything and is perfect for everybody. There are some challenges. There's definitely a learning curve. But it's easy to use if you just use it basically. And then once you get the basic concepts down of how do you link data, how to use those tags, then you grow from there, do more things and more things. Everything that you've seen here, I've learned within the last month. Yeah, I've spent a bunch of time in the tool trying it. I've migrated all of my old OneNote notes over to Obsidian to force myself to get in there and use it. And am I still learning? Oh yeah, absolutely. But like Luis said, there's a huge amount of people out there that are actively developing plugins. They're answering new people's questions. Um, I like following the Reddit, uh, the Reddit and the subreddit uh, r slash obsidian, I believe r slash obsidian, maybe r slash obsidian MD. I like following that. And you'll see people using this for new approaches. If you are into personal knowledge management, there's a huge number of resources out there to help you. 
uh, there's a an amazing, amazing set of free YouTube videos that are called Linking Your Thinking. And it's by a guy named Nick Milo, I believe. And he does an amazing job of showing you how to well, take better notes. How does it fare versus Notion or Coda? You know what? I don't know. I have never used those two tools, Geo, so I can't answer that question. Um, but if you look in that Obsidian forum that I mentioned and search for Coda, Evernote, uh, Notion, you'll see people that have migrated or are thinking about migrating over there or, again, searching this subreddit, and you can find helpful people that can uh, give you assistance. All right. Well, I think that's a good stopping point for us. I'm hoping that you've seen the the coolness in using uh, Obsidian. And for me, as I get more used to it, building my standard operating procedures inside of my note-taking app, building those templates that standardized how I'm collecting data, uh, doing all of these things, trying out new plugins and learning and growing, I'm finding that Obsidian tool can do so many really, really cool things. And I know that some of you probably work as a team. And so you're wondering, well, if I work in Obsidian and my coworker works in Obsidian, can we do that Google Docs thing where we're editing the same document? The answer is not really. Uh, you can sync these files to Dropbox or Drive, um, Dropbox, OneDrive, uh, Google Docs, or whatever. You can sync these files, and there's even certain syncing plugins that you or features that you can buy for, I believe, about $96 a year. You can also connect this to private GitHub repositories and check in and check out content. But it's not something like Etherpad. It's not something like Google Docs where everybody's editing the same file at the same time. But I think it's getting there. And maybe it will get there eventually or maybe it won't. The nice thing about it is that if I'm making things in my... Um, in, let's say that we have a big task. We're researching a company. And my leader, my team leader has said, Micah, I want you to research this person and that person in this company. And then he tasks uh, some other person to research the locations or research the websites. If we're all working differently, but we're using the same tags, we're using those same template files, we can eventually take those data files that are just files on our system and combine them together and then look in there for those links. So you can ultimately move those files together, um, but it's not going to be automatic. All right. Well, I see that there's no more questions and you have been a terrific audience. Thank you for being here, for spending this hour and 15 minutes with me. And like I said, if you're interested in learning more or a less energetic, slowed down, methodical uh, way to learn this uh, in the notes section of this YouTube video, there is a link to my class. If not, enjoy the tool, join the community and stay us and curious, everybody. Goodbye.